you got your Bibles, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Now, we're continuing our sermon series on the, the new heavens and the new earth. And we're calling it the grand finale because this is the way in which the Lord is planning to, to finish everything. The, the call it the culmination of all things or whichever way you'd like to phrase it. And we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now about how it is incredibly important that you believe rightly when it comes to the end of the world. Because if you believe the, the, wrong, the, the wrong theology, you, you will have these issues where it will affect the way that you live now. We, we can't believe the wrong thing about the way the world ends because it will change the way in which you live your life today, these moments now. For example, if we simply believe that the whole world's going to burn up and then we'll all get sucked off the planet and zapped into, I don't know, outer space or whatever, you know, heaven, something, then we will do very little to affect change here on this planet now while we're alive. We will, in fact, disengage from the culture because, hey, it's all just going to burn up anyway. Are y'all seeing what I'm talking about here? It is very important for us as God's people to believe and understand rightly the way that the Lord is actually going to be concluding things. Now, we've been talking about this several weeks, and if this is your first Sunday with us, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the previous sermons on this, because I'm laying a lot of foundations. And there's going to be today some assumptions that I'm making as I'm going into this particular day's sermon. But we believe that the Lord is going to finish His work of renewing the heavens and the earth, and that He is going to be doing that through His church. Amen? We are called as God's people to labor and to work here on this earth, and therefore, we ought to. If the Lord is going to be showing up at the end of all things and, and when the work is actually finished and complete. So today we're going to continue this sermon series. Go to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to read verses 9 through 11 to kind of begin today. Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us your word. Thank you that we can read it and not be intimidated by it, but rather... We can see what your plans for the world are and enjoy you more because of your promise. So, Father, we ask that you would teach us from your word, instruct us clearly, and help us to walk in faithful obedience and repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at verse 11. Well, actually, let's go back. And he carried, let's go back to verse 10. It says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the city, the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the, this is verse 11, having the what? The glory of God. It's radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. Now that descriptor there, radiance, you see that? It's radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal, is a descriptor, I believe, of the glory, okay? We're not talking about the city here. We're not talking about the walls. I believe we're talking about the, the glory of God. And this is very interesting because if you go back to the Old Testament, how is the glory described? I'll, I'll read for you Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You ever heard the descriptor, the glory cloud? You ever heard that before? The cloud of glory comes, right? But see, here, here in Revelation, it's not described as a cloud. It's described as crystal clear light. It's described as this radiance. It's radiance like a most rare Jewel. See, Exodus 40 paints a slightly different picture. Now, that's around the time that, that Moses finally finishes construction of the tabernacle, and then the, the glory cloud falls on it. Now, 
the, in Revelation 21, we see it's not, it's not just the tabernacle portion. So if you, I'm not going to get charts out for you. I'm not that kind of guy, okay? But if you can just picture with me the tabernacle, there's the inner sanctum and the outer sanctum, and then there's the holy of holies even within that. There's, there's uh, concentric circles. They're not circles, they're rectangles, but bear with me, okay? There's these concentric circle idea of holiness. And only over the inner sanctum, over the tabernacle, does the, does the glory of God manifest, but not with the city. See, the city, the new Jerusalem that's descending out of heaven, where's the glory of God in it? Everywhere. It fills it. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel. The city radiates with the glory of God. Not just the inner sanctum, but the entire city. The whole city is shining like, like the Holy of Holies, like the inner sanctum. It's all glowing that way. If you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, you don't have to go there. I'm going to read it for you. But we see a similar description about Solomon whenever Solomon built the temple. 2, Corinth, oh, sorry. <laughs> 2 Chronicles, my bad. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Thus all the work that Solomon did for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated and stored the silver and the gold and all the vessels and the treasuries of the house of God. And if you continue reading on through that, so it's been finished, then the glory cloud comes again upon this particular thing, upon the, the new temple that's been finished. If you go all the way forth, First Chronicles Chapter 5, verse 13, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house. Isn't that interesting? See, when the cloud shows up in the Old Testament, it's a cloud. And they couldn't see well enough to minister. But in the New Testament, what happens? Crystal clear. So clear, in fact, it's like, it's like transparent jewels. Now, what's very interesting, don't Google this, but what's very interesting is if you go and you look up Jasper, don't Google it, don't get distracted, it's going to be okay, because then we're going to be scrolling Facebook. Watch. It's true. You know, I love you all enough to tell you this. Okay, it's true. Now, if you look, what Jasper actually is, it's this beautiful multicolored stone, okay? It's got all kinds of colors inside of it, but it's opaque in its presentation. You can't see through it, in other words. It's not transparent. But the particular city here, the glory of God manifests itself like Jasper, like a rainbow that shines and glimmers throughout the entire city. That all of the light of the city is just covered, is just filled with the glory of God in the form of this rainbow, which points back to God fulfilling his promise that he made to Noah whenever he said, no, 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 I'm not going to destroy the world again. In fact, I'm going to do what? What is he saying? He's saying, I'm going to remake it. That's a fulfillment of God's promise. He's saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to remake the world again. And we're seeing just a glimmer of that here in the new Jerusalem. The glory cloud illuminates the entire city. And light radiates from the city. Like clear jasper, it says. Colors of the rainbow. A bright light, covenant color spectrums the glory illuminating the world. Now, okay. Everybody strap in because I want you to follow me for a second. And if you can follow me, this is going to be a lot of fun. Got notes? Write down Exodus chapter 34 somewhere in your margins, okay? In Exodus chapter 34, Moses talks with God. And he forms the, uh, the, the um, oh man, my brain's farting here. The tablets, okay? The tablets, right? Forms the two tablets with God's what on them? The Ten Commandments, thank you. I love it when people are paying attention. We're firing. See, me and you, we got this. Let's go. All right, so we got the two tablets. But what happened whenever Moses came down from the presence of God? Do you remember? Moses walks out, and everybody does what? Stop looking at me! Why? Because he was radiant. See, he, he was in the presence of the glory of God, so much so that he was, he was glowing. His skin was glowing. Now, where did we see something like that happen? Oh, I'm sorry, before I move on there. And then what did, what did Moses have to do after he left the presence of God with his radiance glory? The people said what? Bruh, cover your face. <laughs> right? Cover your face, man. You're killing me over here. Now, in the New Testament, in the early in the Gospels, whenever Jesus has a similar experience and he comes out, what happened to him? He was radiant. He was white. His garments had changed. He had, he had transformed. They call it the transfiguration. It was a time where he had been changed by the glory of God. 
They, they can't, the people couldn't stand to look at Moses. They could look at Jesus, though. It's interesting. And this is why in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul says this. Paul says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, when is Paul, that's a present tense passage. Paul's saying, right now, we as the people of God are beholding his face, his, his glory with unveiled face, right? Are y'all following with me here? And what does that do to us? That does what? That transforms us as his people and causes us to be radiant to the world around us. And this means that we, as God's people, participate in worship, in glory, with God, in the new heavens, the new Jerusalem, right now, when we gather, and we are being filled with the glory of God in this place today, right now. Right now, it's happening. When you gather for corporate worship, we are gathering spiritually in the new Jerusalem. Do y'all, we talked about this already. Y'all know that, right? Like right now that's happening. That means that you are being exposed to the glory of God, and it is filling you with his radiance. This is what the Bible's talking about whenever it says, let your what? Light shine before men. In that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. See, listen to me. This is one of the things why we talk about church attendance is so incredibly crucial. But here's what I want you to see from this. Part of the reason that the new Jerusalem is so bright is because it's filled with God's people. We're soaking it up. We're soaking up his glory. And we are reflecting it to the world around us. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 says it like this. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And the whole creation eventually will shine. It says in Ezekiel chapter 43 verse 2. And behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel was coming from the, from the way of the east. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And the earth shone with his glory. Revelation chapter 21, verse 24 says, By its light, the new city, the new Jerusalem's light, will the nations walk. You see what's happening here? We are being filled with the glory of God. The glory of God is moving on the earth, and we are transforming it by his power for his kingdom that the whole world may be made new. You are called. That's your job. Do you get it? Oh, man, I hope I didn't lose anybody. (laughs) But this stuff is amazing when we see this. In other words, we enjoy the presence of God together as his people, and as a result, we move forward and change the world for his glory, by his glory, and into his glory. By his light, we see. We see, and whenever we live this way, Basking in the glory of God, worshiping him, delighting in him, being transformed into more and more like him, like his son, then we can bring his commands to the world with greater and greater boldness. No. In other words, let's say it this way. You you were told um, at one point in your life to to make a decision for Jesus, right? Right? Mm -mm. if we're going to be transformed fully from one glory into the next, then it's not make a decision, it's make every single one of them. Make all decisions for Jesus. I I had a friend for a little while, he's passed away, but he said something profound to me once. He said, um, he had a job interview and he sent in his his application and they were like, explain to us how you put God first in your life. And his response was, I don't put God first. You know, that's a little bit of a clickbait moment right there, right? You know, it it is. But that was his point. His point was, I don't put God first. God is central. He's the middle of everything, of every decision that I make, of every single thing that I do. By the light of the glory of God, we walk, we bring it to the nations, and the world begins to follow him. By his light, we can see. And by his light, 
the whole world seems to, seems to gain meaning. And the things of earth, we said this a few weeks ago, will grow strangely bright. Close. You're good, buddy. You, I'm glad you're paying attention. The things of earth will grow strangely, not dim, but, but bright because of what the Lord is doing. So turn your eyes upon the radiance of the city and do the work that the Lord has called us to do. And I, honestly, the radiance is attractive. If you look at Isaiah chapter 60, you can write this down in your margins too. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3, it says, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We shine the glory of God to the world around us by our good deeds. Let your good works shine before men. Now, some will be drawn, that's true, but some will hide their face, right? See, when we bring the commands of God to the world around us, it will stir the hearts of some, and, and some will be pricked, and some will be driven to repentance, and some will hear the commands of God and say, oh, Lord, what, woe to me, I am undone. They will, they will be convicted by God, but some will be the ones who are hiding their face from what the Lord calls them to do. Some will be saying, no, 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 I can't look at this. I can't do this. And, and some will be angered by it. The people of God, those whom God has chosen, when we proclaim his words, his command, his glory to the world around us, will be awakened within their hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they will flock to it, but some will hate you. Amen? Okay. Now let me get to the, to the second piece here. Look at... Uh, Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 12. So there's the, the radiance, the light in which we all participate with, and we, we enjoy it with face uncovered. We receive the glory of God, and we bring it to the world around us. And the Lord continues to build and transform the world through his church by his grace and the proclamation of his gospel and the good deeds of his people. Yes, amen. But look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 12. I'm going to read verse 12 through 14. This is a, a description of the city. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, there's this huge, massive wall surrounding it. Now, hold on, preacher. I, th I thought you said people, people would be attracted. People would come. Why is there a, a wall around it? Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, we were very clear that this is something that exists now, right? The new Jerusalem is present now. This is a, a thing now that the world is, is experiencing through God's church. Amen? This is through God's church that the world is experiencing the new Jerusalem. It exists now. And as a result of it existing now, there is a distinction between those within its walls and outside of its walls. Now, I'm going to say that again because this is incredibly important for us to understand. There is a distinction, there is a difference between those inside the walls of the city of God and those outside of the walls of the city of God. And if you were at Sunday school this morning, we talked about this for just a little bit. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where God pronounces the curse upon mankind as a result of man's sin, God divides the world into two groups. Do you remember what they are? The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And the New Testament confirms this. There's this awful expression that runs around the church that is not true. It is not true, okay? And you've probably heard people say it before, and maybe we've even said it before. We're all God's children. False. We are not. There is a distinction, and even Jesus makes this distinction clear, that there are sons of Satan and there are sons of God. And that goes all the way back to Genesis, whenever enmity was placed between the seeds of the serpent and the seed of the woman, the descendants of the enemy and the descendants of God's people. But here's the deal. You don't know who is who, church. We don't know. We don't know who is chosen by God and who isn't. So who do we proclaim the gospel to? Everybody. We don't even play around. We look for the gospel to work, and there is no one, no one too far gone for the reach of God. And some of you are sitting in this room today to prove that fact. The Lord 
moves on those whom he wills. And he does through, through the proclamation of his gospel. May we be faithful. May we proclaim it. But may we also remember that there is a, a distinction between those inside and those outside. If you go back to Nehemiah, are you familiar with the story of Nehemiah? Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem to do what? He goes to Jerusalem to, to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. We covered this in a sermon series months and months ago. Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. And what happens as he's building the walls? Do you all remember? People outside the walls get triggered. <laughs> right? You remember that? There are people outside the walls who were trying to prevent Nehemiah from completing the job. So much so that the workers on the construction of the wall had to work with a, with a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other in order to finish the job because they were fighting things off, which is part of the reasons that one of our, our symbols that we like to point to is the sword and the shovel to represent Nehemiah, building the wall, building and fighting because that's what God's called us to do. Amen? To build and to fight. Both things are true. But as he's building up that wall, the conflicts get harsher and harsher and harsher with those outside of it. Why? Because there's a distinction. Another way to say it is there's an antithesis. There's a difference, okay, between the people of God and the people of the serpent. There's a distinction. And what's even more interesting is also that as Nehemiah is laying brick upon brick upon brick upon brick, not only is there a conflict outside of the wall, but conflict starts to rise up inside of the wall too. Do you remember that? There were people inside of the city of Jerusalem that were saying, Nehemiah, man, these people are getting mad at us. Maybe we should just slow down. Maybe we don't need this wall. Maybe we can, maybe we can just calm down for just a little bit here. And uh, what did Nehemiah do? I think it was Buddy who was talking about it this morning in Sunday school. What did Nehemiah do? He tore their hair out and beat them. <laughs> And we're probably not going to practice that here in this church. I mean, buddy might, but not me, you know, not me. I'm the nice guy. But listen, whenever you are making these distinctions between the people of God and the people of the world, whenever you, we, we are calling sin, sin, when we are calling what the Bible says is sin, sin to the world around us, you will face trials, not just outside of the church, but inside of the church as well, every single time. Every time, okay, when you are building a wall, when you're making distinctions, that will always be a result of it. The distinction will always happen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Now, when we read that verse, where do we always apply that verse to? Well, come on, y'all. With this participation Sunday, y'all going to be okay. Where do we always apply this verse to? To marriage. But that's not, <laughs> that's not what it said. It didn't say don't marry a non-believer, although that's a duh moment from that passage, right? Okay, yeah, don't marry a non-believer. Got it? Check. But what it says is don't be unequally yoked with non-believers. In other words, there's a distinction. Do you get it? There's a distinction between those who are following Jesus and those who are not. There's a difference, and the Lord would call us not to enter into covenant with them. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? It's important for us as the church to keep the wall up. Amen? It's important for us as the church to keep the wall up, especially in a society in which we live today. We don't even know what a proper human sexual ethic is anymore. We, we, don't, we don't know what boys and girls are anymore. We've completely confused what a gender is. We, there was a, recently a study that was launched by a Christian organization to, to figure out what the definition of a pastor was. It was wild, <laughs> you know? But we, we've entered into this world where we must make the distinctions. And it's honestly more than just a distinction, if we're being honest. Why do you build a wall? Why do, you, why do you really build a wall? Let me say it a different way. Why did Jerusalem build a wall? Because there was a war. That was the threat perpetually against cities in that particular time. It was the threat of war, it was the threat of raiders, it was the threat of invasion. They didn't, they didn't build a wall because they were like, well, I'm, I'm going to put some ivy on it, it's going to be pretty. No, it's not like that. They were building a wall because of the conflict that exists around them. But I have good news. It's going to be okay 
Because if we are faithful and we build that distinction, we build that wall ourselves as well, if we hold fast to the promises of God, like he instructs us to do, the walls are impenetrable. They're unshakable. And the Lord has promised us victory over our enemies, and we can hold fast to them. In fact, if you go read the Old Testament, God defeats his enemies. God defeats his enemies. Amen? He, he defeats them either by smashing their teeth out. It, the Bible says that, by the way. That's not me talking. It's true. By defanging them, which means, that, you know, it means that removal of the threat is what that really means, okay? Defanging them is removal of the threat by breaking their teeth out or, or by killing them, destroying them, or by converting them. Amen? And let's pray for the third one. But God's going to serve justice in the way in which he desires. But the wall is impenetrable, but the wall also has gates. So is the wall impenetrable or does it have gates? <laughs> you know, like, like which one is it? It's, it's both. The, the shining city on a hill has impenetrable defenses, and it's a city of grace and hospitality. It beckons and it, and it invites, and it has gates. Amen? It has gates because it beckons and because it invites. Revelation chapter 21 makes it clear that it, those gates are on every side, meaning every people has the option to enter. Every people is called and invited. There is no one who is held back. Well, there is, but we'll get to more of that in just a moment. And those gates are always open. Revelation chapter 21 verse 25, and, it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They face all four directions. The walls are solid, but there's gates in them. What does that mean? What does that mean? Go to Revelation chapter 21, verse 12. We read it already, but look at it real quick. What's guarding the gates? Do y'all see it? What's guarding the gates? An angel. Not just one, but one at each gate, right? Hmm. Hmm. Can you think of another similar circumstance somewhere in the scripture in which there is a angel guarding the entrance? It's the Garden of Eden, right? Except the Garden of Eden we don't have access to anymore. But yes, you do. Because this is the picture that we're painting here, church. This is the culmination of all things. This is God's design. This is God allowing us to go back to the way things were, the future trajectory, the promise of history. This is where it's all pointed. God is saying in this moment, I am making all things new, including the restoration of the garden from the beginning, and it will be better because you can't fall away from me again. That's glorious good news. But you got to get past the angel. Well, I don't know about you, but I haven't fought any angels recently, and so I'm not totally sure exactly how that would work. Can we think of any other angels that God's people needed to avoid throughout the rest of the scriptures. Passover. Do you remember the story of Passover? I'll just rehash it for you real quickly. God's people, they're slaves in Egypt, right? And God's been sending plague after plague after plague after plague upon Pharaoh and his people. Let my people go. Let my people go, declares Moses again and again and again, and they, they won't. And so finally, God sends the final plague. And it's the destruction of every firstborn in the entire land of Egypt. But God provides a way for his people to be saved. You remember what it was? It was the Passover lamb. Slaughter a lamb and put its blood on your doorposts. And then the angel will know to pass over you, right? Y'all see where this is going? Yeah, you see where it's going. And the angel will know to pass over you and not to take your firstborn, not to bring death upon your house. It's the same thing here. How do we get past the angel into the city of God? The blood of Christ on the doorposts of your heart. How do we enter the kingdom? Do you see what I'm talking about? The city of God is now. The new Jerusalem is now. And we enter by way of faith in Christ every time we gather. We hold up our hands and we confess our sins and we enjoy his goodness and his grace and we bring his radiance into the world around us because of what he's done. Your entryway is Jesus. Another way to think about it is if you go back and you read the description of the city of Jerusalem, the gates are made of pearls. Do you all remember that? 
And they're not just made of pearls, they're made of one solid pearl. Remember, that's an odd description, right? Because I, I ain't never seen a pearl shaped like a, a gate before, but, uh, you know, new heaven, so God can do what he wants. But we remember the story of the parable of the pearl of great price. The one who realized what there was, and he purchased. He sold everything he had, and he bought that pearl because he knew it was worth more than anything else he had. It's the story of Jesus. We give up everything we have. We trust in him, and we walk through, and the angel passes over us because Jesus' blood is covering us. You see, this is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, yeah, there's a city, and it's filled with the glory of God. And that glory is like a light that we are filled with and we bring into the world around us. But that city has walls because the distinctions between us and the world exist. Amen. And we should not be ashamed of those distinctions, but we should proclaim them to the world. Because by proclaiming sin, we have the authority to proclaim the solution to sin, which is Jesus. And if those people will put the blood of Christ on the doorposts of their hearts, they can enter too. You see, it's all there. Bruh, the more I read Revelation, the more I get crunk. This is awesome stuff. It's phenomenal. The promises of God just pour out upon his people. Do not be ashamed of the distinctions that God has given you as his people. We proclaim them with joy. Why? Because we want people to be saved. We want them to put Jesus' blood upon the doorposts of their hearts. We want them to trust in Christ, and they will never have a shot if you don't have the courage to say what's true to them. Stop being a weak church. Mm, that was too strong. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> Let me dial that one back. Oh, don't, don't encourage me. <laughs> it's going to get rough. We as God's people are called to be strong and to not fear what the world would say to us with regard to our distinctions, with regards to us treating sin as though it is such. Because in those moments, you have the opportunity to proclaim the fullness of the gospel. Don't be ashamed. I want to see the new Jerusalem full. Amen? So draw the lines that the Lord would call us to draw. May we never be considered a weak church. May we never be considered ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we look at the culture burning alive around us and proclaim God's truth with joy that we may see them saved. So if you have yet to apply the blood of Jesus to the doorpost of your heart, I invite you to do so today. Repent of your sins. Repent of your selfishness. Repent of your extra-biblical sexual acts. Repent of your homosexuality. Repent of your sodomy. Repent of your unmarried sexual acts. Repent of your addictions. Repent of all these things and turn to Jesus. Amen? Repent of your theft. Repent of your lies. Repent of your abuse. Repent of your pornography addictions. Repent of all of it. Because in Christ you have life. And only in Christ. Christ came to die for you and for your sins and for your failures. Amen, church. And so as a result, may we hold fast to his promise and enjoy and trust in him and in him alone. Let's pray.